I worked the last four years on my thesis project, which we title Neutron and X-ray Surface Scattering Reveals the Morphology of Soft Matter Thin Films. So first, I want to give you a short outline what I preceded and how I wrap up my, my project. I want to give you a small introduction, uh, motivation into the topic, followed up by introduction to Neutron and X-ray Scattering. And then my, my project is based on five papers, so five projects I worked on. First is the surface scattering on polymer resins. Secondly, it's about spray deposited latex nanoparticles annealed and structured, as well as then followed up by three projects about nanocellulose. First one is nanocellulose and morphological surface study, followed with a templated nanocellulose silver nanoparticle growth. And last but not least, the polymer infused templating of na cellulose nanos, cellulose nanocellulose and water degradation. And at the end, I will give you a short conclusion and the outlook of my project. So why do we actually work on such things nowadays? We hear all day, all day long these buzzwords appearing in our society, like Internet of Things, mobility, cloud, 3D printing, automatization, and industry 4.0. But what we don't think about with our new technologies arising, like smartphones, smart watches, and so on, is all the waste coming with it. So we have here chosen a picture of household waste, but not only this is like packaging material, it also comes way more. So our smartphones, they are also getting at some point replaced and getting broken and there's the issue. So these high technology devices have a problem. So usually they're not easy, recyclable and reusable. And as we all know from the beginning of this year, we don't want to work and live anymore a life where we need to wear masks to go around the world and to live our daily life. So we don't want to have this happening. So how can we change this? How can we change this already in research? So we can look into different processes. So that first of all, the production process, we can start with decre decreasing the energy demand in producing actually the devices and applications we can produce these devices by using less solvent or better solvents like water or other environmental friendly solvents. And we can work on our efficiency to produce such materials so on the energy consumption, on the less solvent use, but also on material selection pro uh, properties. So we can think about renewable materials, but as well as recyclable materials and reusable, as well as the material usage by itself. So we. We also tend in our daily lives to have thinner and thinner smartphones. So why not think about on the other side, we can use also thin, less and less material to produce more and more efficient devices. And we want to do this all in a single step process to also force back in this production process, be more efficiency driven, less solvent use and less energy. So what kind of processes are we looking at? First of all, we start with the deposition processes. We all know from our labs the immersive techniques like dip coating, spin coating, spray coating, electromagnetic coating, as well as fluidic coatings. However, in my thesis, I work with spin and spray coating, and there's a pros and cons about both of them. Spin coating is very nice, so you can you can think of a t of a plate which you can coat very nicely on a very nanometer scale, very homogeneous. However, there's there's a limit on the size. We have about tens of centimeters due to the radial forces happening, and each of the layers needs to be done in a batch processing. In spray deposition, it's quite quite, uh, quite different. We, if we just look into the car industry where we use spray coating for car manufacturing, so we can spray the whole car in a, in a matter of uh, one or two minutes, and we can apply there many layers directly after each other, so we can process uh, uh, produce. Uh, spray devices next to each other to directly coat multiple layers after each other. But now, why do we use X-rays and neutron scattering? And here I have an analogy from a Swedish uh, princess cake, actually. So where I want to show you the difference between transmission and reflection um, experiments, which we proceeded during my thesis project. First of all, in transmission, uh, transmission uh, experiments like Sachs and Sons, which you may be well known from, from literature, we can study the full composition of a material solution or whatever, but how can we 
we think about this, if we have this cake now in front of us, and if it, if it would be transparent and look through it, we would see whatever everything what's inside. However, we don't know in which depth it is. So where do we find the nice cream and the gem? In reflection mode, this is kind of different. We have the same cake, but however, we can see in depth where the cream is, where the nice porosity of the cake is, as well as the gem. And we don't need to slice in like I'm shown here. We can look into the cake, not slicing in at all. But what's actually the difference between neutron and X-ray? I just showed you about transmission and reflection mode, but now the difference between X-rays and neutrons. X-rays are scattering at the electron density differences in our material. So they're highly depending on the atomic numbers or the electrons in our material. While in neutron scattering, we're scattering on the nucleus in our material. So there it depends highly on the coherent as well as incoherent scattering length in our material. And if we look into the right, where we have the figure of the different um, coherent and incoherent parts, this looks like very random distributed among all the elements we have in our periodic table. However, this can be really nicely be used to actually gain contrast. So for example, if we look into hydrogen, carbon, uh, hydrogen polymers, we have a, a contrast up here. But if we deuterate the same polymer, we can induce a, a very strong contrast to carbon because H and C is actually very close together. And that's why we can induce a massive amount of contrast. While in X-rays, the contrast is always depending on that. However, in X-ray scattering, we can also tune um, the, this, the contrast by changing the energy. We can actually be on the energy level changing the contrast if we look for different absorption edges of our materials, like the carbon or the sulfur edge of our materials. As well, what I didn't say yet is that X-rays can, can be produced nowadays in high flux. Therefore, we need big facilities like synchrotrons and the neutrons like reactor sources or spallation sources. The problem with this is always that you need to apply for these experiments. So you write a proposal, it's a project application, it's like a grant you get, and then you go to these different facilities around the world to proceed your experiments. And throughout my thesis, I went to these different facilities to, to make multiple projects. And this is quite tough and demanding, but it gives you a very nice insight in your material and not only a, a fraction of your material characterization wise. So what do we see actually with neutron X-ray scattering in this reflection mode? We call it GZAX or GZANs, depending if it's X-rays or neutron scattering, or if we are in the diff diffraction regime where we look into an atomic and uh, if we look into the atomic scale, so from angstrom to nanometer level, it's called GVAX and G so how do we do this, this tuning where we look into the meso or atomistic scale, so we impinge with the X-ray or neutron beam on our sample, it gets scattered and reflected, and we, we depending where we put the detector, if it's just on the 10 centimeter range away, or if it's on the meter range away, we tune if we are on GWAX regime or in the GZAX regime. In the GWAX, we all know that from, from X-ray diffraction, we can study the orientation or we can study crystallites, but also in reflection, also the orientation on the substrate. So if it's face on or edge on and so on. Yeah, we can tune with this nice technique also the depth in our material. So we can be either surface sensitive. If we look again into the cake, we can see if there's sugar on top or how deep the, the, the marmalade is. If we do this in our sample system, so you can calculate how deep you are penetrating with your X-ray beam or neutron beam in the material, we have the so-called critical angle, which is a material dependent scattering angle. And if we are just moving over this angle, we see that we are going micrometer deep in our material. But we can be very tunable along this, this incident angle to be either surface sensitive in just a few nanometers or very deep in our material. But now to the scattering itself. If we look back here to the scattering um, on our 2D detector, we can get out different um, things of our sample. So first of all, we, we have the so-called QZ or Q parallel and QY direction in our detector. While QZ, so the height here, gives us something like nanoparticle height and roughness. While in, in, in QY, we get something like distances and radius of the material. And if we then look into the, the, the theory of that, then we can understand where this all comes from. 
the scattered intensity is actually composed of two, two factors. The first of all is the, the structure factor, which is actually a lattice. So where our nanoparticles or our scattering centers are distributed on our surface, as well as the secondly, which is called the form factor. So how are these particles appearing? Are they more like spherical, cylindrical, or lamella? So these are the three main, main features we will see in soft matter science. Throughout my thesis, I actually focused on this, this lattice here, which is called a paracrystal. So if we find a particle down here and we go further away, the probability to find this particle in area is increasing. So if you go the furthest away, the particle can be e anywhere in this gray circle and don't is, is not sitting on a well-defined super lattice structure. But now to my projects. So first project was about surface scattering on polymer resins. Here we used uh, industry prepared uh, polymer resin from DSM. We spin coated it on a, on a silicon substrate and we had a high and a low TG uh, polymer resin. We, we induced a photoinitiator prior to spin coating and photopolymerized this polymer uh, with a UV light, which you see here. So I built this small chamber, which is a nitrogen flushed environmental chamber. And I, I shined with the UV light on the sample while shooting or illuminating with the X-rays on our sample and get our scattering image on the detector. So what, but how do we, so what actually do we want to see here? So first of all, in chemistry, you always start with FTIR. So you look into how our bonds are changing. And what we look into here is just a small fraction of the whole FTIR spectra. But we see that this C double bonding is actually decreasing in size when we irradiate with UV light. And this is actually a sign for the conversion and the polymerization of this material. In the LT sample down here, you see that the peak is fully disappearing disappearing, so we have a full conversion of our material. While in the HT sample, so the high ITG sample, with the, the peak is not fully disappearing and we have something which we call vitrification or restricted mobility. So the polymer is not fully uh, polymerizing due to the fact that there's nanostructuring and this is hindering the full conversion process. But therefore we come back to that. So for the X-ray scattering, we're the first doing this um, so we wanted to see if we actually see something with X-rays because it was never done before. And we used X-rays to, to probe the, the sample and to see if there's nanostructuring occurring during this, during this scattering experiment. And we do this by putting up the sample in our environmental chamber, illuminate with the X-ray beam, and then doing intermittent measurements. So we, we turn on the, the UV light and then we do our X-ray measurements and this we do multiple times, and so we can see now the structuring, if it's there or not. But we can see it actually. So with the white arrows, I mark here the areas which are evolving over time. So you see here the white arrow, it's moving to the right when applying more and more um, illuminated light. And this is then the, in this white box here, we do a, a 1D integration, we get this nice sharp peak, which is small side peak. While the inner peak here is the resolution factor of a uh, resolution function of our beamline, and the peak on the side here is our side peak, which we interpret as a domain, domain feature occurring and growing during uh, this time evolution. <clears throat> um, yeah, then we we think we thought about how we can interpret it. We we said it's a domain feature, but we, we think it's a spherical feature as it should grow in all directions anyway. I mean, there's light exposure and then it grows in, 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 in spherical way. So we have this, this growth of the spherical feature. And if we follow this by the size, we have something which is growing from 40 nanometer up to 200 nanometer in the LT sample, while in the HT sample, it starts in a very smaller range and then goes up to 70 nanometer. We can directly correlate this actually back to our conversion, which we calculated with the FTIR. And it has exactly the same trend. So we have this exponential function going up and the HD sample here shows that we have just around 80% conversion while the LT sample is nearly full conversion. And you can see that also depicting here with the, with the change in mobility. So they grow till they're locked and then there is unpolymerized polymer left. 
if we now do X-ray reflectivity, in X-ray reflectivity, we don't look into the diffuse scattering on our detector. We look into the reflected uh, intensity on our detector and monitor this while rocking the sample in, in incident angle. And we did see then this nice oscillation. If we fit this, we get something like this. This is a figure of our density along the Z surface normal of our sample. We have the, the substrate density, we have the oxide layer on top, as well as the resin and then the air. And what we actually can follow is the roughness bo on both or on all interfaces. But we are interested mostly on the air as well as the interface at the backside of the sample. So at, at the bonding where the polymer resin sits on top of our silicon substrate. And if we follow this in the HT sample, we have a decreasing in roughness. So it's somehow smoothening. While in the HT sample, we see an increase in both in the, in the surface roughness as well as the roughness on the bottom. And this can be maybe problematic for industry where you apply a coating like on the table and then you polymerize it and then it lifts off the sample, uh, lifts off of your table because it's de-wetting due to a high roughness. We think this comes actually from the starting Guinea radius, which we extracted from our from our polymers prior depositions, prior spin coating with SACS measurements. And we think due to the HT factor where we have a higher radius of duration and gain a lower cross-linking density, therefore we get a better roughening because there's not, not all on the surface polymerized and that's why it's smoothening out the surface. But now we see all the time in, in my scattering images these nice oscillations. If we look in this direction, we integrate it along QZ and we plot it here in this waterfall plot. We see these oscillations are disappearing. And this is called correlated roughnesses. But what is correlated roughnesses? Correlated roughnesses we can, we can see here. So we have a substrate roughness and the full correlated film would be fully reproduce the roughness from the substrate beneath. If we look into a sample where it's just partially correlated. We have a roughness, but then the roughness is just partially correlated, as well as no correlation occurs when you have something yeah, completely arbitrary. And we find that with the LT sample, we get a, a longer correlation length, while a shorter correlation length with the, with the HT sample, where we have a higher radius. And now to project two. Where I first applied now spray deposition, before it was spin coating, now we do spray deposition. I used latex as nanoparticles produced from a colleague of mine. Latex nanoparticles are core shell nanoparticles. They have a core polymer as well as a shell polymer. In this specific uh, samples, we used PMMA and PBMA core polymers. The first is high TG and low TG, while low TG is around 40 centigrade and high TG around 130 centigrade. The core is hydrophobic as well as the shell, the shell is hydrophilic. And from each sample, we produce two sizes, a small and a large size, and we deposit it with a single spray pulse, so very little amount on the surface. And we annealed these, these nanoparticles on the structure and wanted to see how these nanoparticles evolve in structure. In the scattering pattern on top here, you see the, uh, the, the room temperature the scattering pattern, and we see this nice uh, pseudo break peaks, and they are disappearing with increasing temperature. And if you do again this integration, you see that this peak, which we see here very nicely as a, as a bar, is disappearing and moving to the left. So it's in, enlarging in size. But if we now apply the model I showed you before, the paracrystalline model with a spherical, um, spherical model, we can directly see how large are these particles. So we can really follow the nanoparticles evolution over temperature. At the beginning, we see that they're not changing up to 70 centigrade, and then they're enlarging already, even though they're below uh, the um, TG of the sample. So they're melting or they're deforming already, even though we are below here, below the TG of the samples. And we have always two sizes, and we think one is the initial nanoparticle, which correlates well with the nanoparticle, which we found with DLS measurements and as well as AFM. And the second one is aggregate. So we see already aggregated nanoparticles repeating on the surface. But what else does this morphological change may in induce in the sample system? First of all, we used AFM to see that. First of all, we, we look into the PMA sample, sample and their structural integrity is quite well 
So we see very nice nanoparticles on the surface, very wide distributed. So on a one by one micrometer image, we see only very little nanoparticles. On the PBMA sample on the other side, which has a low TG, we see already cores of boundaries and as well as coalesces nanoparticles as just on the room temperature spraying directly after spraying. If we now look into the contact angle, we can see really that we can tune the contact angle very finely by tuning the temperature. If we look into the small PMA nanoparticles, we, we, we don't change it at 40 centigrade, but we know that the structure changes all above like 70 centigrade and at 140 centigrade, it goes up. And here we are now more on the PMA um, block, which is introducing this uh, contact angle. In project three, I used the first time a Tempo CNF, so Tempo oxidized CNF with a charge from 400 to 1,400 micromole per gram. What we actually, why we actually use um, spray deposition, which I didn't tell you beforehand, is because we can actually scale it very large up. So we, we built a roll, I built a roll to roll uh, setup so I can spray on meter scale. But here I just want to show you on a 10 by 2 centimeter scale that we can, we can uh, spray deposit nanocellulose on, on these large wafers with a, with a roughness of around 2.5 nanometers if we use the, the correct tempo CNF. So actually by correct, I mean you can use this uh, charge to tune the roughness. So if we use the lowest charge, we have around 8 to 9 nanometer roughness and then we go down to 2.5 on the highest charge. While we actually also tune the water contact angle, or in general, the surface energy of our material by tuning the surface, <laughs> the surface charge on the cellulose. So what is actually highest affected, so we used uh, three different uh, probe liquids. We used water, diode methane, and ethylene glycol to probe the surface energy and not just the water contact angle. And by this, we can really tune and see how the polar and dispersive component of the water contact angle uh, of the surface energy is actually affected. And we see that the polar component is the highest affected, which comes from uh, Coulomb interaction, so the permanent and induced dipoles. And then, but what we didn't see or what, what we didn't include into this graph is actually that their roughness plays a major role into this graph here. And that's why we used uh, the the Wenzel equation to calculate a contact angle which is independent of roughness. And then we see really that the contact angle is going down with inducing higher surface charge. In nature, this is actually used on leaves. Here you see it on a leaf which I just picked outside the lab. So on the surface of the oak leaf, we have a very good wetting while on the bottom is very repellent. Here it is not from rough or not only from roughness, more from waxes, but this is for cleaning purpose and to opening all these openings in the leaf to, to breathe. But now we apply again GZAX on these samples and we want to see how the nano morphology is changing inside the sample when the roughness on the surface changes. At least that's what we believe that it happens, but we actually don't see any change in the inner morphology when we apply different surface charges. We find large features when we model the surface as well as medium-sized features. The medium-sized features well overlap with, with already published CNF bundles data and with the, the large features we couldn't attribute at that time. But on the other side, we look into the uh, QZ direction on our detector. We see a small peak appearing, which is enlarging with higher surface charge. And this is actually the critical angle of water. And this is increasing. And we have all the time this film at 120 centigrade. So this means that even at 120 centigrade, the fibrils are still coated with water at super high charge. And it was always said that this freezed water or bound water is only at ambient temperatures always present at such high um, charges. But we thought about it more. We thought about what happens actually with when we induce even more water in the system. As this is very interesting also for industry, we use GZANS now, so the neutron scattering part of, of this gracing incidence uh, technique, and to want to see how this morphology is changing. So first of all, we use a model now with three different sizes because we have an enlarged Q-space. So we can see also a very small size, which actually directly correlates with the individual nanofiber. 
And we can now attribute or we can cycle the humidity. We cycle the humidity from very dry to wet and to dry again. And what we see is actually that this largest uh, cylindrical size, which we've seen before also in GSAX, actually goes to a spherical shape when we humidify it and goes back to cylindrical structure. And we attribute the, this now to maybe structure pores, but we don't know it yet. But how can we use, or can we actually use this as a feature? Can we maybe infiltrate not only water, but polymers, so use like uh, functional materials inside? And is this cyclability even more reproducible on, on larger and more cycles? The problem with GSAN's measurements, they take quite long in hours, and you get very limited time, so we couldn't do it in that time, but we do it on a later project. In, in paper four or in the project where I now templated silver nanoparticles grows on nanocellulose. I sprayed silver nitrate on cellulose and want to degrade it to get bare silver. We, we, did, we done that with a single spray pulse to use as less as possible silver nitrate. And we done that and comparison on, this, on this just a silica substrate, so just few silica a glass slide. And what we actually see is that we can decompose the silver nitrate by heat influence to silver oxides and nitrogen dioxides. In literature, this thermally starts at 250 to 440 centigrade if you don't lose any, if you don't use any catalyst. And if you want to prevent any oxygen, uh, silver oxides appearing, then you even have to go to 200, above 280 centigrade. But on the same side, we want to prevent that the CNF composes, which happens at 240 centigrade. So we want to be beneath that. And that's why we applied a medium high temperature of 180 centigrade. And we see already after like 50 seconds that a plasmonic peak is appearing when we do this transmission experiment. And this plasmonic peak directly correlates with the silver nanoparticle size as well as with their energy, with their energy band gap. But coming to the energy band gap, so we can tune now or use this spectroscopic data and produce a tauk plot to get the energy band gap. And the energy band gap is then plotted like that, or the, the tau plot is plotted like that. We, we fit a linear tangent on it, and we can directly read out the energy band gap. And it, now we can see that we can tune with time the energy band gap in our functionalized film, which is really nice if you want to maybe use these nanoparticles now in OPVs or in other light harvesting devices if you want to tune the energy band cap for that accordingly. But how can we really know that this is silver and not silver oxides or something else? So therefore we done diffraction measurements like wide angle X-ray scattering. And we follow here just the peaks. So this is what you get out, you get like a nice peak shape pattern, and then you just follow the intensity of these peaks according with temperature in this time. But this time not about time, it's about the temperature. And we see that at around 160 centigrade already, okay, we could have done our UVVIS measurements at lower temperature. We see already that it starts degrading and goes fully down. The silver nitrate peak is fully disappearing above 160 centigrade. And the silver peaks on the other side fully appears. But what we see at the beginning as well, that there is still oxide at around 170 centigrade. So even this 280 centigrade where uh, silver oxides are not appearing is wrong in very thin films, we can be 180 centigrade and we don't have any oxides left, we have pure silver and we have a very nice system. But now we want to compare the sizes on the different substrates. So we have the cellulose substrate as well as the silica substrate. And if we use Scherer equation, we can directly use this peak width here to calculate the actual size of these nanoparticles. And we have a very constant size in both the, the the um, silica substrate as well as the, on, on the CNF substrate. What we actually see, we have a larger size on the CNF substrate, initially with the silver nitrate, and the smaller size on the, on the silica. But when we heat up the sample and they decompose to, to bare silver, we actually see the opposite trend. On the silica, we have much larger particles compared to the smaller size particles on our CNF. And actually, why we... As we just did one spray pulse, we couldn't find actually plasmonics, anyhow plasmonics on the uh, silicon dioxide substrate, but we found it on the CNF. And we think that the cellulose actually hinders the nanoparticles to coalesce and be individual small nanoparticles, while on the sil silica substrate, these 
silver na uh, nanoparticles are coalesced to form bigger nanoparticles, and this correlates well with these measurements. And now we applied again GSAC's measurements. And what we actually did here is we wanted to get a better model out of our measurements. And therefore, I, I did born again to these pattern simulations. So we get the scattering pattern and we fully model now this uh, scattering pattern and get to the right where we see always the simulated pattern. So they're very well um, matching. And what we directly get out is a real space model. But for this, you need supercomputing. And this is very energy harvesting, <laughs> energy demanding actually to do this. That's why we just produced two, Im uh, three images. I think two more are in the thesis. But what you nice, what you get out, additionally to just the distance of the nanoparticles and the size of the small nanoparticles is also the height and the roughness. So you can directly correlate it to AFM data or to other complementary methods. But now to project five, where we looked again into the water degradation of these thin films and as well as polymer infusion into, into this cellulose templates. So therefore we used a widely studied um, a conductive polymer, P.PSS, as well as our previously mentioned CNF template from um, project three. So what do we start to want to study now? So how is the polymer actually distributed among this CNF template? I think I didn't mention it before, but we look into just very thin layers of 200 nanometer or beneath those very, very thin films. And we wanted to see if maybe the cellulose helps the, the P.PSS from demixing and stabilize these films, as well as how does the functionality as conductivity is changing if you tune the environmental influences like water in the water humidity. So first of all, we start again with our CNF template, as this is our reference sample. So we set our humidity chamber to zero and 100 uh, relative humidity. Well, you can never reach it, but anyway, you, you do two full cycles instead of our one first cycle, which we performed before, and we do our GSONS experiment again. And what we actually can confirm is that our model fits perfectly, and we can see full cyclability of these films. So they swell in size, they change slightly the appearance from cylindrical to, to spherical substrate, uh, to spherical appearance, and back and forth, always when we wet it to dry it. But now, we in induced this uh, functional polymer inside, and we wanted to see how this is affecting actually the film formation or the film under this cyclic humidity. Um, yeah, under the cyclic humidity. And what we first did is actually we did a conductivity study. So we start with the conductivity of the S sprayed film, and we have actually already quite high uh, conductivity for P.PSS films around uh, above 250 uh, kilozems per meter. And if we then wet this sample, it goes down to 225. While if we dry it back, it just relaxes, but not fully back, just to 235 uh, kilozems per meter. And this is now quite fascinating because there's a big step going down and it never relaxes back to, the, to this initial value. And we can explain this now with our model when we do our GSONS experiments. So when we do our GSONS experiments, we can see that we have a non-cyclic behavior in the first cycle. So we have something, a structure which is increasing in size when we wet it first time and increases even further when we dry it. And we can explain this very easily. So spray deposition is a non-S spin coating as well, uh, both non-equilibrium layer techniques. So you deposit nanoparticles on a surface, but due to high temperature, they evaporate very fast and they lay, lay down where they are stuck. If we now look into our model, we see our S deposited model, where we see all different three structure sizes which we have. But then we have this largest feature, which is this blue up here, which is growing when we wet it, and it grows even further when we dry it. So when we, we explain it this way, so we have something which is arbitrary lay down and not in, in the meter stable. When we wet it first time, it swells, it de-wets the CNFs, and then we dry it. It forms a very a, a nicer layer. It, but how can we prove this? So therefore, we did now neutron reflectivity measurements to prove that there's a change in gradient, in density gradient along the z-axis of our sample. 
Therefore, we went to Japan, to JPARC, to produce this uh, NR experiments under cyclic humidity. And we see that, so first of all, we start again with a CNF film. So we have a CNF uh, scattering length density, which is swelling to the point that it's double the thickness of the initial 20 nanometer in this, in this case, 20 nanometer up to 40 nanometer film. And we have a water layer forming on top of our cellulose film. If we now look into PSS, we have a big gradient actually. Usually you look for a flat plateau if you want to have a really, really nice layer. That means that you have a perfectly yeah, layered sample or a, a very good density along your sample and then you want to have a sharp boundary. Then you have a, yeah, the same density along your whole sample stack. In case of PSS on spray deposition, we get a very yeah, harsh uh, gradient. And if we swell it, we see just that the contrast is varying, the contrast goes up, it's very, it's slightly swelling, about double the size, but it also, yeah, it, it would relax back. If we now look into our uh, nanocomposite, we can see that it swells very little. So if we, if we take CNF and P.DSS together, the swelling is prevented massively as well as the the, the gradient changes. So the gradient changes not as much as before. And so we can say that we confirm the structural integrity in our model. Now, how can we visualize that? I mean, you can directly maybe use such a sample as electrode and materials. And you would see that after deposition, you would see that you have issues from the S deposited and cycling and the humidity influences. But we can also directly use the CNF as a showcase for showing uh, humidity sensoring. And here I, I sprayed uh, nanocellulose. For that. Yeah, so here we sprayed cellulose on a mask on, the, uh, on the silicon substrate and we sprayed it to a thickness so we can see nice color effects from the thin film uh, reflectance and when we now breathe again it against it and film it with a normal smartphone camera we can see the swelling directly by the color so we have directly humidity sensor here simply by spraying nanocellulose if we would now put the p.psS inside we could also measure the resistivity changing under this very fast and cyclic um, humidity effect and you see it I, I I breathe multiple times against it and it's very fast in, in relaxation time. So now I want to give you a short conclusion. So we could show that scattering resolves nanostructuring during polymerization, which was never seen before. We could follow the morphology of nanoparticles under thermal degradation or thermal changes and induce with that a different wetting on our films. But however, there's still an open question, which we look into now with uh, neutral reflectivity. If maybe just the nanoparticles uh, collapsing or if the polymer chains are fully aligning and so really give uh, induced wetting by the alignment of the polymer chains. We can see that the charge does not affect the inner morphology of the CNF, however, it in induces more water inside the film. And we can see that we, when we change the surface charge of nanocellulose, we can change the surface energy as well as the roughness of our material. We can tune by the induced uh, silver nanoparticles with silver nitrate decomposition on nanocellulose. We can tune an energy band gap for all PV applications. We can, cyclable, we can cycle uh, CNF and nanocomposites and see their structural differences. And we know now that such preconditioning of these films is needed to prevent later changes in your application. In my outlook, yeah, I didn't show you anything about my roll-to-roll -roll spray coater, but this is functioning, it's just under commissioning. We, we can spray on a meter scale now these films on flexible foils. And we currently actually, since about one hour, we are running an experiment in UK where we use this P.PSS and nanocellulose in an inoperando supercapacitor and look into the cycle behavior of a supercapacitor in <clears throat> GSAN's measurements, so how this OC oxidation happening during the cycling together with Lin Shipping University. And what I wanted to stress here is that all this needs way more modeling improvements. We 
be we need more image recognition and neural networks with training data to improve this insight in our material on the nanometer scale. And I want to acknowledge all the people I work together. It was always a big effort with many people involved. First of all, my group in Hamburg, PO3, then the fluid physics team here at KTH, the laboratory of organic electronics, as well as coatings department and the technical university with E13, many more, my supervisors and my family. 